This recording was produced by Oregon Trail Baptist Church. If you'd like to get more recordings or to leave your feedback, please visit us at www.otbchurch.com or write us at P.O. Box 298, Guernsey, Wyoming, 82214. We look forward to hearing from you, and we hope that today's recording will not just challenge your thinking, but will transform your life. Genesis chapter 1, we'll start there this morning, we'll read the first few verses here, first five verses. Uh, well, this is a continuation of last week's sermon on the gifts of God and, and the gift of light. Uh, light is just a very rich theme in scripture, and so I wanted to catch a few more nuances of that before I left that topic. Genesis chapter 1, a uh, very familiar passage, uh, but starting with verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. And the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters. And God said, Let there be light, and there was light. And God saw the light, that it was good. And God divided the light from the darkness, and God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And the evening and the morning were the first day. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We're thankful that although in the midst of my forgetfulness and my human frailties, you're a God who never fails. And as we read the account of creation, we're constantly reminded how you made a perfect, wonderful, good world with light as the first thing listed in your creation. As we examine a bit of this theme of light in Scripture this morning, I ask you to open our hearts and minds to truth. Shed light on our understanding. And may we draw closer to you and your word this morning. In your son's name, amen. Last week I opened with an illustration from Martin Luther with him being the first to put candles on Christmas trees, at least as the story goes, um, and, and bringing that element to how we decorate our Christmas trees. Last week we looked at a few things. We looked at how God, first of all, is the giver and you could say maker of light. And we looked here at Genesis 1 where God created light and it's good. And again, in, in last week's sermon we tied in James uh, chapter 1 verse 7 where every good gift comes from God. He's the father of lights. And so light is one of these good gifts God has given we then talked about how God is light, something of his very nature. First John 1 John 1.5, this then is the message that we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. We noted some of the Psalms and other passages that even describe God as being clothed with light and radiating light. We then took a third and more practical approach to light in that God's light directs his children and we talked about Psalm 119, 105, where it says, Thy word is a lamp to my feet and a light unto my path. And we concluded last week with how we view God. God is the maker of light. How we view him and think of him is important. Because if we view him, like James says, um, we, we should view him as a good God who gives good gifts, and light is one of these good gifts. But then we also concluded that do we walk in the light God has given. That walking, like Psalm 119 describes, the word is a lamp to my feet and a light to my path. God delights in directing his children. I'd like to turn this week, uh, and, and more nuanced, although it will sound echoed of some of the things from last week, but how God's light brings salvation. Now, it's easy for us to associate light with its counterpart, as far as we, we put those together in mind, light and darkness. And when we think of light, we've kind of already covered this, of light is often symbolized or, or depicted or, or shown as God's presence. Where God's presence is, there is light, because God is 
light. And darkness is the absence or the opposite of God. Darkness in Scripture becomes synonymous with all things that oppose God or his character. And light is those things that connect to him. We'll begin here with by taking a look at Proverbs 6, 23. Here in Proverbs 6, 23, we read, For the commandment is a lamp, and the law is a light, and reproofs of instruction are the ways of light. Now, so there are several verses in Scripture, and here's one of them, that talk about God's light as a way of life that is walking in accordance to God's will. And although technically this verse is actually um, a proverb coming from a father like Solomon to his son, there's some, some really rich truths here because this verse equates walking in the light with walking according to uh, the commands or the reproofs and instruction of the father. So light is connected to both life in this verse. It's connected with walking in, in, in doing the commands and reproofs of a father. Now, don't you wish and hope your children would listen and obey to what, what you say? And they learn from your mistakes? Now, God is a heavenly father. He hasn't made mistakes, though. But God is a heavenly father, gives commands and instruction and correction to his children. And God is the heavenly father who gives instruction and commands to his children. It, this verse would apply to us in that regard as well, because for the commandment is a lamp and the law is a light and reproves our instruction on the way of life. If we're going to walk in God's ways, we will walk in the light. I'm sorry, what? Light of, light of God. Exactly. Now, Israel did not always follow this instruction. We actually hit this in Sunday school, and then it's one of those themes that comes up over and over in Scripture. And because they didn't follow this instruction, Isaiah writes in, in Isaiah 2.5, he says, O house of Jacob, come ye and let us walk in the light of the Lord. Kind of a wink, wink. You're not walking in the light of the Lord. Let's do what we're supposed to and walk in the light of the Lord. And as one writer describes this light, it says, the light is, is a sphere of God's presence and life within. That sphere evidences those qualities that reflect his character. When you have very little light, you begin become very dependent on light. God's light, walking in his light, is significant for everything we do in life. When we were in high school, uh, we had a youth group and there was about 10 of us, um, in 10 or 12 or so in the youth group, about five or six of us guys, and every year was the tradition of one of the activities is we'd go spelunking in some caves in Makoka to Iowa. Now, if you're not familiar with spelunking, it's where you decide to crawl in through caves and explore and everything like that. It's lots of fun, I'm sure. Um, the older I get, the less fun it sounds. Uh, however, we, th we would always have a great time. It was the first activity we'd do every year in the fall uh, as the start of the school year. So. We did this year after year. For those of us who'd been to the caves before, it's the same ones over and over, so you kind of you know what to expect and you know what to find. The awe and wonder of your first trip is, is gone. But there was one cave that we called the Y Cave. Um, we didn't call it that. It was actually named that. Because as you go down, it splits into two branches, and you could take either way, and then you'd have to come back that same route. And it was the not the biggest cave in that you know, like if you walk into some caves or like the size of this room. But it was the longest one that we could do, where you're crawling on your belly and in around rocks and whatnot. We're down there, and it, outside it had been kind of a cloudy day. Like it could rain at any moment, but it wasn't raining yet. And what do we care? We're climbing in caves and getting muddy, so what's the little rain hurt? Well, we start to notice water's coming in this cave quite quickly. And those of us who've been there before realized this is not good because as water fills up this cave, there's only one spot to get out of this cave. And it's a spot you have to shimmy through and crawl down in and through, and only one person can get through at a time. And this cave is beginning to fill with water. Now, I don't know if we were at full risk of it actually filling with water or not, but we all got really scared and started getting out of there quick. We were yelling to the other people who had gone down the other section of the Y and said, You've got to get out, get out quick. 
The problem is, in the middle of this excursion, my flashlight died. I pulled my backup out, and it didn't work. So I am now without light in a cave. And some of you have been down in mines and whatnot. You know what that's like to not have light at all. Well, I can't say I didn't have it at all. I had to follow the person in front of me had a flashlight. The person behind me had a flashlight. So I could walk in the light of their light. Do you see what I'm saying here? I, yes, there's a bit of shadow from the person behind me because he's shining his light. And I can see a little bit of, of, but my body's blocking some of that. But I am totally dependent on these two people with their flashlights to get out of this cave and to be able to see. This is what it's like for us to walk in the light of the Lord. When we try to walk on our own without that, those other lights, the imagery of groping becomes very real. Because all of a sudden it's like, I can't see anything. I have to completely rely on my senses, like hearing and, and feel. And I don't know about you, but you ever walk around at night and bump your, your foot or bump your toe or bump your knee? You tend to do that when you don't see, or if I don't put my glasses on. Um, but in a cave, there's no light other than what you bring in. And so that was a situation that for me, it's like light is important. It's important to follow and walk in the light. What would happen if I veered off and decided to let them go on their own way and I'm going to go a different direction? I'd be stuck because I needed that light. God's presence is light and it is life. And when we oppose him and his involvement and his workings in our lives, we find ourselves very quickly in darkness and death, as several other verses suggest. I want to pull up here Deuteronomy 28. And I want to introduce it before I read it. Deuteronomy 28 is in a section of curses that will happen to Israel if they don't follow God. And in verse 15 of the chapter, before this verse here, um, it says, but it shall come to pass, if thou wilt not hearken unto the voice of the Lord thy God, to observe, to do all his commandments and his statutes, which I command thee this day, that all these curses shall come upon thee and overtake thee. So Deuteronomy is giving us a framework here. If you don't obey, if you don't, as we're saying today, walk in the light, these curses are going to come. And as we read these two verses here, we read, Deuteronomy 28, 28, The Lord shall smite thee with madness and blindness and astonishment of heart, and thou shalt grope at noonday as the blind gropeth in the darkness. And thou shalt not prosper in thy way, and thou shalt be only oppressed and spoiled evermore, and no man shall save thee. This comes in a list of these curses, and as you read this, darkness seems to be connected with the idea of if they don't, if they don't follow God, it, the depiction here is that of madness, blindness. That's pretty close to being dark. Can't see. I mean, I, I don't know if those who are blind can see shadows or not. You, you know, sense the differences in light. It depends. Some can. Some may not be able to. They grope at moon, noonday. You can't see. You're groping in darkness. You could say here, what God is cursing Israel with, if they don't follow him, they're going to be connected to everything of chaos and disorder and destruction and despair and hopelessness. And the, the verse, verse 29 ends with, and no man shall save thee. Sometimes we have this false idea that even though we haven't gone God's way, somebody will bail us out. And somebody or something will make it better when our only real true answer is to turn back to the Lord. Darkness is the opposite of light. And when we follow God's commands, there's a whole list, and it's we don't have time to go there, of blessings for Israel when they follow what God said. Now also here there's the element of tied to salvation. And the picture of salvation is coming out of darkness, coming out of danger and destruction. Um, and it's spoken of in terms as well in Scripture. So for instance, in Psalm 27.1, the Lord is my light and my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Whom shall I be afraid? 
The passage goes on to describe how all these foes are against the psalmist, and against, but with God on his side, he doesn't need to be afraid. God as his light, the one illuminating, awakening him, uh, the one who's guiding him, the one he's walking in that light, when he's there, he doesn't need to be afraid. Now, we all find ourselves in situations in life at times where we're afraid. Sometimes it's silly fears. Sometimes it's real fears. Real things happen in life, and there's a situation, or there's an event in the family, or there's something, and we are honestly afraid. And maybe afraid's not the term. Maybe we're just agitated, irritated, on edge. And, and the psalmist here is, has foes against him, but he doesn't have to be afraid because he's protected and walking in the light of the Lord. The Lord is his light and salvation. The Lord's his deliverance. And when you and I face an event or a situation or something in life where we are afraid, we can walk in the light of the Lord. Remember who he is, that he is light, and remember that he is our salvation. Nothing can happen to you or me that God doesn't allow, that he doesn't know about. Nothing catches him off guard. We can walk in his salvation. This idea of God being our salvation and light gets even more personal in other Psalms where God is described as leading us towards salvation, kind of like a shepherd leading sheep. And I think the best, before I get to some examples, God is not an inanimate object. It's not like God's a street light on the corner that only shines at one spot. God is more like my friends in a cave who their light is guiding you as you're moving through the cave. Does that make sense? God's with you. He's walking through life with you, not just, okay, there he is way down there, and that's where his light shines, and he's never going to be with me and never going to give guidance here. He's only there. That's not how God works. God meets us where we are. He gives us light in the situation we're in, and we follow that light. So bringing it back to how God's light is personally guides us, some examples of this. Psalm 18:28 For thou wilt light my candle the Lord my God will enlighten my darkness. Here's a description of God being the one who lights not just darkness in general but my darkness. In Isaiah uh, there's <clears throat> another uh, verse here it says and I will bring the blind by the way that they knew not. Here's very active here God bringing those who are in darkness, those who cannot see, he's bringing them along the way they knew not. I will lead them in paths that they have not known. I will make darkness light before them and crooked things straight. These things will I do unto them and not forsake them. You walk with God. God walks with you. His presence is light. His presence goes with you. And the tone of confidence here that pervades these passages demonstrates that there's no doubt that God's presence as light will conquer and even eliminate darkness. We touched on that last week, but this is very comforting because darkness is always dispelled by light. And if God is light, no darkness no evil, no, no entity, no person, nothing can oppose God when he is light. And so with God as light, we're never going to be on the losing side if we walk in his light. It doesn't mean life won't have its ups and downs. It doesn't mean we won't go through the valley of the shadow of death, but we go through the valley with our Savior. One preacher, a um, while back, somebody had a video they wanted my wife and I to watch, and it was a sermon a guy preached. And it was quite a... I, I wasn't sure if it was a sermon or a comedy routine at first, just the way the guy was preaching. But he drove home this point, and he had a picture made with a T-shirt with a little sheep holding on to the shepherd's hand and looking over at the wolf and saying, I'm with him. And that's the idea. When we walk in God's light, we're walking with him. There's going to be light there. 
because we're with him. We're in his presence. And no evil can overtake us. No circumstance can overrun us. Moving, even, even more narrowing this concept down of God as light, several times in Scripture we have Christ as our light. And Christ is our light. I want to start by looking at Matthew. And these are well-trodden, worn Christmas passages. But Matthew 4 here says, The people which sat in darkness saw great light. And to them which sat in the region and shadow of death, light is sprung up. Luke says, very similar, he says, A light to lighten the Gentiles and the glory of thy people Israel. And this is... Um, Different people speaking in, in the book of Luke, but both picking up this theme of light. And remember, Jesus is the very presence of God. And it's interesting to me that Matthew writes, one of our famous verses on, on the virgin birth, in, in Matthew one twenty three. Behold, a virgin shall conceive and bring forth a son, and thou shalt call his name Emmanuel, which being interpreted as God with us. Well, if the light of God and his presence in the Old Testament is going with us, and when we are with him we have light, Matthew, I think, is even connecting this idea of God with us, with Jesus being light. Luke makes a connection as well. Um, but both of these authors, Matthew and Luke, are pointing back to a passage from Isaiah, one that we have read, I think, already a few times. The people that walked in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in a land of shadows, in the shadow of death, upon them hath light shined. So remembering that the Old Testament has connected light with God's presence and leading and guiding his people, both Matthew and Luke are connecting this prophecy of Isaiah 9-2 with that. But John really takes this light imagery to a whole new level. In John chapter, verse one, or chapter 1, um, verses 4 to 9, he says, In him was life, and the life was the light of men. And the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Um, the word comprehended there is a bit complicated. It could go a couple different ways. And I, I think the best way to understand it is the darkness could not stop it, couldn't put it out, couldn't resist it. Uh, the passage goes on. There was a man sent from God whose name was John. We read about his birth in the Bible reading this morning. The same came for a witness to bear witness of the light that all men through him might believe. He was not that light. John wasn't the light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. Who's the light of the world here? It's Christ. Now, if you think back to John, though, First John, or, or the Gospel of John, John begins with, in the beginning was the Word. Now, we're, we're going to put what we talked about in Sunday school to the test. In Sunday school, I mentioned how today we use hyperlinks in our you know, passages, or we use footnotes to tell you where something came from. Where else in the Bible have you heard in the beginning was? Any connections? Genesis. John, even in the Greek here, I was taking a Greek course, and they were going over this passage. And they had to stop and say, what's happening here is not normal Greek. This is actually Greek following the Septuagint or the Hebrew. This is mimicking Genesis 1. Now, what's the first thing God makes in Genesis 1? Light. Who does John have as the light of the world? Christ. Now, John makes some clear distinctions. John is not saying that God made Jesus. Okay, that's not what he's saying. He's saying that, that Jesus was there in the beginning. Jesus was creating. But in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God, and the Word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by him, and without him was not anything made that was made. He's connecting Christ and God together. And then he talks about this light of the world that's coming. And John's going to prepare the way for Jesus to be the light. And in Revelation... Um, John will eventually, I, I, I need to cover one more verse before I get to Revelation. I'm getting ahead of myself. Um, John 12, 46, Jesus said, I am come a light unto the world, 
that whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. The key to walking in the light and being in the light of Christ and of God, his presence going with us, is to believe him. I'm come to be light. Whosoever believeth on me should not abide in darkness. You want confusion? You want turmoil? Stop trusting God. Stop depending on him. Stop looking to him for answers. You'll find yourself quickly in darkness. I'm not saying you're not saved. I'm not saying you, you know. But if you and I walk in the light, the only way we can do that is by exercising faith day by day, moment by moment. I was getting to it with Revelation here. This description of God in the new heaven and the new earth, the new Jerusalem as it were, and John describes there in Revelation 21 a city, and, and the city had no need of a sun, neither of the moon to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. John is describing New Jerusalem as a place where there's no need for a sun or a moon because God walks there in the light. Remember, God is light. And in heaven we'll be walking perfectly with him in light. Now I want to apply this one in, I hope, the most obvious way. But first of all, humanity... From Genesis 3 onward, we see humanity as groping in sin. Nobody seems to escape it. This hope of, of a, a Messiah, uh, I sometimes wonder if the Jews look to different figures in their history, like, I wonder if it's King David. I wonder if it's going to be this person or that person. But then sadly, each of the characters in the Old Testament, and as a whole, the nation falls and fails. They all are plagued by this problem we call sin. It's a problem that plagues us all still today. Christ came as the answer and the fix for the problem. He would deal with the sin problem. He would pay the debt we couldn't pay. He would satisfy God's wrath. And believers, by faith, we depend on what Christ did. We depend on his work on the cross. It is enough. It is finished. What he did is good, and we can be at one with God. We're no longer enemies with God. We're not, we're, we are now in, able to walk with the Lord because of our faith in him. Not that it's some work, but we're trusting in what Christ did, and that gives us the ability to walk with him. And believers are now free to walk in the light. And remember, the Old Testament concept, walking in the light, is walking in whose presence? Christ or God's presence, right? And again, just my mind's going back. What It was a pillar, a cloud by day, and what at night led the Israelites? A pillar of fire or light to lead the Israelites. God leads his people. And so... Several times in Scripture, believers are called the light of the world. Christ said in the Sermon on the Mount, he said, Ye are the light of the world. The city that is set on a hill cannot be hid. Paul writes to the Philippians, and he, he describes, you, you, you know, um, the ways of the nation are crooked and perverse, but among them you walk as lights in the world. To the Thessalonians we read, Ye are children of light and children of the day, we are not of the night or the darkness. Peter writes, he says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people. They should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. A verse we looked at last week and reviewed this week is 1 John 1, five. This is the message we've heard of him and declare unto you that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. But then John goes on to say something else. He says, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another. And the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If I in that cave decided to 
walk my own way and take a different route or path and let my friends go on with their light. And then I sat there and said, well, I'm walking in the light. I'm finding my way with my own light, but I have no light. How foolish and silly is that? Am I going with my friends? Not at that point. And so for us to depart from what God has for us, what he's instructed us, uh, what he's impressed on us to do, what the Holy Spirit's calling us to, for us to depart from that and to go our own way and then to say, well, I'm walking in the light, it doesn't work. In fact, John says here that when you walk in the light, you have fellowship one with another. When you walk in darkness, there's more conflict. There's more turmoil. There's selfishness, which breeds problems between people and problems between groups and kingdoms and tribes and nations. But when you walk in the light, you have fellowship one with another. And as John said, the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses us from all sin. So as we close out here this morning, I, I wanted to at least clearly, if, if at all possible, connect the fact that God's light is connected with his presence do you spend time in that presence? Do you spend time with him? I mentioned that sermon I talked about earlier, but where we're described as sheep, and Christ is described as the shepherd. And similar language of a sheep being lost, and he's often confused and needy, and the shepherd is the one who brings comfort and security and protection and order. When you and I do not walk in the light, and walk in the Lord, we very quickly find ourselves in trouble. Trouble we can't get ourselves out of. Also, is there a situation or a circumstance in your life where you need the light of Christ to shine upon it? John, in his description of light in John 3, of the Gospel of John, just after the famous verse of John 3.16 we read this, and this is the condemnation that light is come into the world. And men love darkness rather than light because their deeds were evil. For everyone that doeth evil hateth the light, neither cometh to the light, lest his deeds should be reproved. But he that doeth truth cometh to the light, that his deeds may be manifest, that they are wrought in God. In our fallen sinfulness, we don't always like the light. We don't always like... In the morning, it actually happened this week, so it snowed, was it yesterday it snowed? I think, yeah, okay, I think it was yesterday it snowed. I forget now. At 5 o'clock I get up, and there's no snow on the ground. At 6 o'clock I get up, and there's no snow on the ground. But at 7.05, there's snow on the ground. And in my mind, I'm thinking, I have one hour to get all the businesses shoveled. I've got to move quick. Now normally when I go to get my clothes on, I, w I was sleeping upstairs. Um, the kids and I have been sleeping by the Christmas tree. They like to do that, whatever. It's kind of a Christmas tradition. I'm running down to the bedroom and normally I take a little soccer ball light the kids have into the room because it's kind of a softer light. I don't want to wake my wife and any kids sleeping with her. I don't want to wake them up. Not on this morning. I just flipped on the switch and away I went. Now my wife's here shaking her her head. I don't know which way she was looking. Did you appreciate that light coming on right away? <laughs> and we've all been there. When you're in a dark setting and a dark situation and there's suddenly light, we don't like it, do we? In our fallen sinful nature, described as darkness, it only makes sense we don't like the light. Because sometimes the light feels painful. Sometimes somebody telling you something you need to hear is painful. Sometimes correction, as you're reading God's word and the Holy Spirit speaks to you and says, you know, this is something you need to change, it's painful. Sometimes hearing a, a sermon preached on a certain topic, it's painful. In our fallenness, we don't always like the light but we need it. We desperately need it. And there's no circumstance in our life. Sometimes we're afraid 
for Christ to shine the light because we almost don't know what to expect. We, we, we don't know what he's going to pry and we've closed off a section of our heart and life and we don't know if we want to quite go there. Folks, Christ is light, but he's also life. And where the light of God is and his presence is, there is life and there's fullness of joy. And yes, there may be a temporary pain as, as we give up something that we're holding on to, but there's light and life when we walk with the Lord. And lastly here, are you bearing the light? Back to what Christ said in Matthew 5, ye are the light of the world. You don't light a candle, as the text says, and put it under a basket. You don't turn on the light bulbs and put a plastic sack over them. You don't do that because you want the light to shine. And sometimes it gets easier to just keep our mouth shut or to not say something. Or sometimes it's easier to go with the flow when we are to be light in a world. And just like early morning when your eyes are, have been covered all night and you've been in darkness of sleep and that light doesn't feel good, sometimes when you and I are light, it will not feel good to those who live in darkness. Now please don't be offensive by it and shine headlights in their eyes. Okay, I was a bit conscious of that this morning as I was clearing off some properties and I I was driving by, it was a mobile home here in Guernsey, and I, they turned a light off, and so I'm like, oh, somebody's up in there. And I, I take a corner right around where this house is, and I, the, the ranger did a complete 360 in the middle of the street. And I felt horrible, because here's this big old spotlight now on their living room window for a few seconds. I'm thinking, they're, they're, it's early morning, they don't want all this light. So we don't need to be bulls in a china shop. But we shouldn't cover our light. We shouldn't hide it. We shouldn't try to dim it. We are to be the light of the world, and it's only going to happen if we walk in the light that God provides when we are in his presence and when we're walking with him. Let's close in prayer. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. And as we've taken some time to consider this concept of light, and it's a gift from you, not only a gift that we enjoy day to day with, with the sun, and even at night the stars and, and moon as they reflect some of that light, but as we've looked at this week, your light is connected to your presence going with us. Lord, we're thankful that you're not like a lamp post at the corner of the street that only shines light in one spot. Wherever we find ourselves in life, you will light our way forward. And sometimes it's not always a straight path. Sometimes it seems to be bumpy and up, up and down. But you have a perfect path and plan for our lives. And sometimes we don't like it. Because our sinful nature prefers the darkness. But Lord, peel back the layers of our hearts here this morning. Give us a desire to walk in the light and the life of Christ. With heads bowed and eyes closed, as Mrs. Driscoll begins to play a hymn of invitation, let me ask you to do business with the God, with, with the Lord. Ask Him to shed light on your life. What is something that He may be calling you to change or adjust?
So this year, as you look at Christmas lights and you see Christmas lights, let it remind you, Christ is the light of the world, but his light is a presence that goes with you. And maybe you can remember this too, as Christmas lights, if you kind of watch them, sometimes I'll turn the lights on here at church because it's enough to melt the snow so they don't form icicles. With light, there's heat. And in the coldest of summer, or cold of summer, the coldest of winter, and the darkest of night, where there's light, there's the warmth of God on your presence and with you, if you and I will but walk with him. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we thank you for your word here this morning. We thank you that you are the light of the world and you've called us to walk in that light and to be bearers of that light. We ask this morning that you would help us this week to respond in faith, trusting that your plan, your path is perfect and would we bear the light to those around us. We ask this in your son's name. Amen.